Good morning, everybody. This is Rama on Riding, coming to you live from beautiful, sunny Sedona, Arizona. Everybody else in the country is covered in snow and freezing weather, and Sedona has unseasonably warm temperatures. So I guess, uh, you know, we're the lucky ones here. You know, when I came back from Hawaii, we had a little bit of a cold snap, and uh, now we're back into our normal winter, moving up over 70 degrees during the day, uh, perfect mountain biking weather. Um, this was an interesting week for me. I finally got to do the clearing work with uh, Gwen and Deborah Diane. Uh, we've been trying to get this scheduled in uh, all of our schedules since about August, and uh, it just wasn't happening, and I was just kidding them, uh, or kidding Gwen, because I'd really never spoke with Deborah Diane until uh, uh, the other day. I was kidding Gwen that she didn't think that mountain bikers could really get clear. Well, uh, they proved me wrong, and I can't joke like that anymore. It was really an interesting experience. Uh, uh, Deborah Diane is, you know, some sort of a psychic, uh, uh, a reader, if you will, and uh, she uses uh, muscle testing to determine what issues uh, you're ready to deal with uh, in clearing. And it was really kind of an interesting uh, concept. Um, the image that I had was uh, if I looked at myself, you know, uh, intuitively, I was kind of uh, a double image type uh, uh, vision. And as I did the clearing with uh, Deborah Diane, that double image kind of came into one and I kind of integrated a lot more. Um, she cleared some, you know, stuff uh, with my, you know, my mom and my dad. Uh, she uh, helped me understand, uh, you know, why I might be struggling to uh, get certain books out. And this was kind of interesting because she, uh, you know, she said, well, you know, you're the first author that I've worked with that, you know, uh, you know, there's nothing I can do to, to help you get your books out except tell you that you need to focus on the promotion of your first book. Your other books will come in their time. And I think that was really helpful for me to hear because, yes, I do need to, you know, work with the promotion of my existing book to move, uh, move on. Well, that's kind of, you know, the Rama update uh, for today. I want to move quickly into our author interview uh, today, and I haven't actually checked my list to see if, the, uh, if Catherine is on the line. So let me uh, bring my list up. We just closed out the um, Publish Now support webinar, and so uh, many of those uh, authors are moving into the uh, the uh, next webinar here. Uh, so far we have 33 people on the line, so I want to thank you for supporting uh, Catherine Carrigan. Um, Catherine Carrigan is, uh, you know, an amazing uh, gal. She's written a book called What is Healing, and she is a medical intuitive. Um, her book is, you know, not on the short side. It is a longish book, so I admire anyone that can write uh, a book that's more than 30,000 words because I never plan on doing that myself. It's just uh, way too much work to uh, publish it for me. Ha, ha, ha. Um, there, uh, I remember at the webinar when Catherine... Uh, uh, I mean, the retreat, when Catherine finished her, you know, her draft, uh, she started crying. The release was so intense for her. Um, and it was really, you know, an interesting thing. Uh, you know, we get very uh, emotional 
um, and passionate about our works. And I think that just showed me how passionate Catherine uh, uh, was about her work. Um, the truly amazing thing is that Catherine has a practice. Uh, she is able to do her yoga and her meditations, her tai chi's. She's able to uh, do her digital marketing. She regularly has blog postings and newsletters going out. She's active on many social media uh, sites. Uh, and the coolest thing that happened was that last, well, yesterday afternoon when we were firming up the uh, webinar, you know, Catherine says, hey, look, I'm going to uh, send out a blog post, a newsletter post. I'm going to create an event in Facebook uh, for this uh this uh, webinar, and it struck me that no other author has taken it to that level. And, you know, this was not something that she spent hours doing. You know, she's so good at this stuff that she, uh, you know, you know, clicked a few buttons, wrote a few things, and it was off and running. And I uh, took a look at, you know, the list numbers, and between, you know, last night and, uh, you know, today there are about 10 new names that had registered, uh, you know, for the webinar. And so it did have uh, an impact. And, okay, you know, 10 names doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're talking about a webinar that has uh, my, uh, I think the, the most number of people I've ever had in one of these webinars was 44, that amounts to you know, 25 percent, uh, you know, new people that might be on board. So with that, I want to uh, give uh, great kudos to uh, Catherine Carrigan. We're going to let her speak for a while and tell her story, um, talk about whatever she wants to, and then I'm going to get to uh, ask her a few questions. And if you all have questions for Catherine, uh, you know, uh, you can type them in and I will see them in the, uh, in the um, chat menu. Uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, otherwise, I'm not going to be able to unmute the, uh, the group. There are way too many people. There will be way too much noise. So um, if you do have questions, put them in the chat menu. I'll, uh, I'll ask uh, Catherine. Uh, uh, what they are, and if you want to speak, uh, raise your hand. Uh, hit the raise your hand button, and I will, I will try to unmute you if we have time. Um, since I'm not doing anything after the hours up, if we're still active, uh, we will keep uh, uh, Catherine in the hot seat. Uh, Catherine, I'm unmuting you now. Oh, um, there you are. You're unmuted. Okay. How are you doing well, today? <laughs> well, good morning, Rama. I really appreciate you having me on your show. And um, a couple things. One is I do all my work very prayerfully, and it's my intention, you know, by being on your show, that I wanted to help the other writers and authors because writing a book and publishing a book is, you know, really quite something and um, very challenging. So what I did was. I, I actually wrote a blog article on, you know, thoughts on writing and publishing. And if you would like to read the blog article, if you go to my website, which is www.catherinekerrigan.com, and it's Catherine with a C, C-A-R-R-I-G-A-N.com, um, there's a picture of an orchid. Of course, I love orchids. And it's a, anyway, you'll see it there. So just click on, on writing and publishing for Rama on writing, and I actually published it this morning. And um, Greg Kesey, our wonderful web guy, who is my personal hero, who's been one of the people who really helped me, he put a jet pack on my blog and my website so that when I write articles, then they immediately get broadcasted out and they go to Facebook, Pin uh, LinkedIn, Google+, um, Twitter, um, uh, Tumblr, and then I put it on uh, uh, Pinterest. 
So, at um, any rate, a couple things. First of all, I, uh, any of the other authors who would like to cross blog with me, just send me an email and I uh, completely comprehend the value of that. I have traded blog posts with Deborah McTiernan, who is uh, another fabulous author through the Tom Bird program. And my rule is, is that I will post one of your blogs for every one of your blogs that you post for me. Um, Anyway, so before I begin, I, I just want to say something somewhat funny because I was writing this list of, you know, helpful things, you know, uh, that I've learned, such as it is, from this writing process. And one of the, my points was how important it is to have regular practices to keep your energy flowing. And then what happened was, long story short, last night in the middle of the night, my partner, Ken, I had to take him to the emergency room. So I literally got about one hour of sleep and we got home, you know, about 6.30 in the morning. So if I sound tired, this is not the usual me because I usually have a lot of energy. And uh, so just thanks for bearing with me and Ken is fine and, you know, they've got everything sorted out and that's a whole other story, but uh, it was a different evening than usual. So the first point that I want to make for all of us writers and authors, and I also got um, a question on Facebook asking, you know, well, would this webinar help me, you know, if I want to write fiction? And the answer is yes. And um, my first point is that I think that we need to give ourselves to permission to be a beginner. Um, I'm 54 years old, and by the time that, you know, we're our age, a lot of us have developed areas of expertise and we're used to being good at things, we're used to the things that we are good at being easy. Um, however, this whole writing and publishing process is so complicated and there's so many steps that more than likely we're going to come on to a number of steps for which we are total beginners. Now I've taught yoga for 18 years. and Part of what I like to do from time to time, I actually like to put myself in the position of being a beginner so I have compassion and understanding of what people go through when they are a beginner. And when you watch somebody who's a master at something, so for example, if you watch Tiger Woods play golf, he makes everything look effort and easy. And so sometimes what I'm getting at is that when we're older, and we're used to being good at things, we're used to having things be relatively effortless and easy because we've done what we do for 10, 20, 30 years, and then we go to write a book or publish a book, and it's all completely new, and we've forgotten that being a beginner is actually a very energy-intensive process. So my point is, is that I think that it's important that as we are beginners that we learn how to be patient with ourselves as we flounder around and learn new things, and that learning how to be patient with yourself is, in my opinion, an essential sanity saving skill. Now my second point is it's very important, I think, to have some kind of regular practice to keep your chi open and flowing. So chi, as you all know, you're all smart people, otherwise you wouldn't be writing books. Chi is prana or energy. And uh, I know personally I have a number of clients who are editors and writers and artists who don't actually produce anything and the reason is that they're energetically shut down in my opinion. So they're either too unwell or too energetically shut down to let that energy flow. And what we have to understand is that chi is creative in and of itself. Chi has its own intelligence and then it goes wherever it needs to go whether it's to write a blog, make a book, help you have the energy to produce your book or what have you, or heal whatever needs to be healed. Now personally, I practice yoga, qigong, and meditation every week. I know that Rama rides his bicycle. And so the truth is that different things work for different people, but the way that you know whether or not your qi is flowing is, do you have plenty of energy? Do you feel good all day long? Do you have the energy to write a book? 
And I know that for myself, writing and producing this book was a very energy intensive process. I remember, um, as Rama mentioned, I'm a medical intuitive, so I sort of asked for guidance about literally everything. And the week before I went to the Tom Bird webinar, I rested like crazy. And I even asked myself, I thought, gosh, you know, I sure I'm lying around a lot, lay around in my hammock. I rested like crazy. And I thought, am I resting too much? And when I got to the webinar and wrote my book, the answer was no. <laughs> For me, doing the webinar was like, you know, maybe running a marathon. And I did, you know, give it all that I had. And um, it, anyway, it was a very rewarding process. So I, we want to have regular methods to keep your own chi flowing. Um, now, the third thing that I think is really important is to have a regular practice to clear your emotions. So in natural healing, we recognize that emotions can shut down literally any physiological process. It was my experience, at least for me, that writing a, a book is a very emotional process. It takes a tremendous courage to write a book from your heart and to put down on paper what you really think. Um, I got, I was speaking on the phone with somebody who had listened to my audiobook and I spoke to her this past week and she said, wow, it took, it must have taken a lot of courage for you to do what you do. So when we put, you know, we basically are bare our souls on paper and then we're sitting around wondering, does anybody like it? Is it going to get anywhere? Is anybody going to buy their darn thing, etc." And um, so there are so many ways that this process can go sideways. And if we don't have methods of clearing the emotions that come up, that lack of you know, emotional clearing can shut us down. It'll make us feel discouraged. We want to give up and you know, stop the process. And yet, if we just realize that it's just energy emotion, keep that energy moving, keep the emotions flowing so that we can keep going with the process. Now, my fourth point that I want to make is I think it's very important to find the very best people that you can of the highest integrity to help you. Now, what I did, again, it is helpful to be intuitive. I actually signed up for the Publish Now program before I'd even written my book. And I had signed up for the webinar, uh, the, the, the uh, as I said, I'm really tired having not slept very much. I signed up for the uh, retreat to write the book, and I saw that if I signed up for the Publish Now program ahead of time, that it would be you know, the cheapest that it would be offered, and it would be even cheaper than if I signed up during the retreat or after the retreat. So I tuned in, and I signed up, and I had a friend who had, I, was someone who had actually coached, and I had convinced her she needed to write a book. She wrote two books. She did it all herself. She was ripped off numerous times by numerous people. And when she, we looked at the Publish Now program, she said, Catherine, gosh, this seems like a lot of money to me. It was, I think, about $5,000 at the time. But when I looked at it, you know, soup to nuts, I think it actually saved me money because it put me in touch with very high integrity people. Now, as I said, one of my processes is that I find people that I can, and then shut up, listen to them, and do what they actually tell me to do. For example, I hired Denise Casino, who helped me get my book to number one on Amazon, and it went to number one on Amazon in two categories. And I told Denise, I said, I, went to, I was Phi Beta Kappa at Brown for one simple reason. I find the very pe best people and then I listen to what you actually tell me to do, and then I actually do it. And she, Denise told me, she said, Catherine, I think you're my star student, because she told me what to do, and then I worked it. And I listened to Rama, I listened to the webinars, and um, the people that I really most want to thank are Greg Kesey, who has just done a phenomenal job, because I had a website, I had a blog before all this started, but as part of the Publish Now program, I got in touch with people who are website experts. I had the website experts. I paid them extra to analyze my websites. And they said, 
that my website and blog failed every test. So not only did I have to write the book, I also had to rebuild my blog and rebuild my website. So Greg Casey was phenomena, phenomenal. Um, Thomas is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Thomas Hill, um, when we were working on the editing of the book, I communicated with Thomas, who at that time was my copy editor. And I had a question, and Thomas emailed me, and he said, Catherine, I think you need to work more on your book. Now, when you've already put your heart and soul into your book and worked very, very hard, the last thing you really want to hear is you need to work harder on it. But once again, I went off to myself, and I asked for guidance, and I got the guidance that if I worked with Thomas, he would help me make my book 30% better. So even though I was at the point where I was ready to publish the book, I hired Thomas, I spent an additional three and a half months, and then we worked together and brought the book to a whole nother level. I also made an audiobook, and as I said, uh, Denise Canisina was phenomenal, and as Rama said, whenever I got stuck, which was almost every week, I would call Rama on the phone and ask him what to do. So the next point that I want to make is to do each part of the process with your whole heart. So there's so many steps in writing a book, and I think a really good way to do it is just to take it almost like chapters. Like when we write a book, we write a book in chapters. And when we produce a book, we produce it in chapters. And even though there's a lot of things we can do simultaneously, if you produce each chapter as well as you can, you're going to end up with a good product. So for example, when I, um, I had a book release party at my house, well, I spent three eight-hour days just sending out all different kind of invitations. I made jewelry so that anybody who bought my book that day, I would actually give them a pair of earrings of their choice. They got to pick which ones for buying my book. We spent a week organizing the, the food. And then the day that actually came around, it rained cats and dogs. And it was a May day, and we had to have a fire. But because we were so well prepared, it ended up being a wonderful, happy party anyway, even though it was raining and probably fewer people came because of the rain. Now, the next point that I want to make is that I think it's important that we acknowledge our weaknesses and get help or training if necessary. And I appreciate what Rama said about me working with the social media because the truth is, is that if you ask me, I'm not a geek, and I know little to nothing about computers. And what happened to me was in January 2011, my computer broke, and then my cell phone broke all within you know, a couple of weeks. So I ended up having to go to the Apple store here in Atlanta. And when I went to the Apple store, the re they told me that re my, the reason my computer died was that I had been shutting my computer down incorrectly every day for four years. So I realized, OK, Catherine, you know nothing. So I signed up for the Apple one-to-one -one program, and I went there regularly to take lessons to learn more about the computers. So then when we go into this Publish Now program, I have to admit, when I started talking to Greg about doing my website and the social media business, I was so nervous, I was actually stuttering. And I felt completely overwhelmed. And um, Greg told me about that website called lynda.com. It's L-Y-N-D-A.com. So it's $25 a month. And for $25 a month, you can sign up and take a course for how to do Facebook. Now, if you're 20 years old, you know, you can just laugh at me because if you're 20 years old, you don't need to take a course on how to do Facebook. Some or another, you just do it all by osmosis. And one of the things that the people at the Apple Store helped me with, they talked about uh, language natives. So, for example, if you grew up in Spain, you would more than likely know how to speak Spanish from a very early age. Versus if you moved to Spain when you're 30 years old, you'd have to learn. And for those of us who are older, and I'm 54, when we go to this computer stuff and the social media, it's all new to us. And we have to make more of an effort to learn than people who are younger. So we just have to be patient about that. 
And um, I also hired uh, Heidi Richards to look at um, <laughs> what I was doing. And that was, frankly, very difficult because I was doing so many things wrong. It was a long list of everything that I was doing wrong. And as Rama talked about, you can only just sort of start with one area and you know, start to become better at one thing at a time. Now that, that brings me to my seventh point, which is I think it's important for all of us to recognize that social media is the new reality. Now personally, I have several friends who are roughly my age, and I've seen them get out marketed by people with half their experience, half their knowledge, half their expertise, because these younger people were better at Facebook and better at these other aspects. And um, I even have a long-term client who comes to me for business coaching, because I do all kind of coaching and healing work and clearing work. And I told her a year and a half ago, you've got to market. You've got to get on social media. And it was, she made me laugh recently because she was telling me how proud she is because she's finally on Facebook. But we, whether we like it or not, we just have to embrace this. And to me, this is like the IRS. The IRS does not ask me whether or not I enjoy accounting. But using that as an analogy, I'm not good at accounting. That is not my area of expertise, but I have what I consider the world's greatest accountant. I love my accountant. And once a month, she and I sit there and you know, go through my accounting. And now everything's gotten to the point where everything's totally under control and in a really good shape. And it's because I found somebody who I personally like and who we communicate well with. And then we have this ongoing relationship to get better at something that I'm not particularly good at. Now, the eighth suggestion that I have for my fellow writers and authors is that I think it's really helpful to have other hobbies in addition to writing that help us understand our own creative process and our own creative rhythms. So, for example, um, one of the things that I do is I have orchids. Well, most orchids are not in bloom 100% of the time. Now, I have had orchids who bloom continuously for years in my studio because I have such a great spot. But the truth is that all living beings have life cycles. And I uh, make jewelry, I knit, I take pictures with my iPhone, and then of course I write. And um, what I personally do, I like to keep everything fun because if I'm having fun, then I'm in a high vibrational state and that gets comes across in whatever jewelry I make or whatever I knit or the writing that I make. So um, after my book went to number one on Amazon in October, I didn't blog for about two months. I was like, OK, I'm tired. I recognize I'm tired. And when I write, I don't want to come from this tired place. So I took the time off. And, um, and then when I went back to my blogging, I was back in a state of joy again. Now, this was totally against the advice that I got from Heidi Richards, because she said, you've got to have a system to keep everything going. And I understand that. But what I like to do, in a nutshell, is I like to give myself permission to be in a state of passion. And if I'm not in that state of passion, like today after being at the emergency room all night, you know, I'm probably going to lie in my hammock or go for a walk or do something to rebuild my chi. Um, and when I do my writing, what Heidi says, it's the best idea if you stick to your keywords. And I do write a lot about natural healing because that is my passion. But I think it's more important to write from our passion. So I also write a lot, about a lot of other art articles about totally unrelated subjects. Like I've written articles about butterflies and orchids and penguins and gardening and just things that just really you know, light my soul. Now, the ninth thing that I want to say was that when I created my blog, I created my blog with all kind of beautiful pictures. And that's because I actually see the world as an amazing place. So in other words, my blog is literally my vision. And 
on my blog, I have pictures of butterflies, my orchids. I have a picture of a feather I saw just lying in the street on one of my walks. I have actual photographs of actual angels around my house and garden. I have pictures of penguins in the Falkland Islands and the mountains of Antarctica. And my point is for my fellow writers that every writer has a unique way that we see the world. And helping other people see the world in the way that we do is part of our gift to others. And um, that can come across in our blogs and, and also our books. And I think Rama is right that when people sort of enjoy your vision of the world, they're going to be more likely to read whatever you have to say. So my last point was that um, I did listen to the webinars. And one of the things that Tom and Rama talked about was the importance of trademarking you know, what you're doing. So for example, I know that Deg McTiernan is going to write a bunch of Lily Noble books, and she's working on that. And Rama is going to write a bunch of mountain bike booking books. So I took the extra money, and I trademarked the phrase, what is healing, because I want to write a series of books about natural healing. And I think as a writer, that when we find our true passion, whatever that is, whether that's poetry or fiction or mountain baking or you know children's magic books, that we can set ourselves up so that we can spend the rest of our lives writing about what is most important to us. And also, I made an audio book of what is healing because I know that there are a lot of people in today's society who are actually too busy to read. And for about five years, I spent an average of three hours every day in my car in Atlanta traffic. And the only thing that kept me halfway sane was listening to audiobooks. And I think it's very important as writers that we have compassion for our readers and think about what they're going through in their everyday lives and present our books in a way that will actually make our readers better. And um, as an interesting sort of PS to this story, I recently got a call from a lady, um, and she was born in the Ukraine, who bought my audiobook. So this is somebody I'd never met before, never had any interaction. And she said she bought my audiobook, and that before she bought my audiobook, she'd never been a runner. But somehow, when she started listening to my audiobook, she started running. And she said, when she listens to my audiobook, she can run for four miles. And she says that when she doesn't listen, she can't run. So there must be something, even though my book has nothing to do with running, there's something in my audiobook that uplifts her and gives her energy so that she can discover a hidden aspect of her own strength. Um, the last thing that I want to say is that I have to say that writing this book, What is Healing, was one of the most profound spiritual experiences of my life. And when I talked to Tom Bird in one of our brief conversations, he said to me, he said, Catherine, I don't think you understand the concept of divine timing. And um, so I'll just finish with this story. When my book was, there was a week when I wanted my book to go to the publisher. And I worked hours and hours every day to try to get my book to the publisher, or to the printer, which is Lightning Source. I published for the, printed through a Lightning Source initially. And it didn't matter what I did. The facts got lost. The lady received the facts. Her child got sick, yada, yada. Finally, the book went to the printer on my birthday, March 25, uh, 2013. And I just laughed because to me, it made me realize that having a book is like, have, it must be like what having a child. You give birth to it, you nurture it, you do everything you can do, and then it just takes on its life of its own. And um, so it was a very humbling experience. And um, I, uh, anyway, so thank you for uh, having me on, and uh, hopefully that was helpful. And I'm sorry that I don't have the energy that I usually do. Um, but. Uh, Anyway, I'll be happy to take questions if anybody has any questions. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Catherine. Uh, it sounded to me like you had lots of energy, uh, so you must be a real fireball when you do get a good night's sleep. Uh, you know, um, 
since I always have the mic control, I get to ask the first few questions. And I, I've always been intrigued by the term medical intuitive. And so, you know, my question is, what is a medical intuitive and how do you become one? Oh, good, good question. Well, I'm going to give you sort of a short answer and a long answer. Um, so, um, and given my current state, who knows what's going to come out. But basically, long story short, I'm actually psychic. And my whole life, I kind of knew that I was smart. Like, I went to Brown. I was Phi Beta Kappa. I never pulled an all-nighter. But, you know, somehow I just managed to, like, sail through. And um, anyway, I started his studying healing work. And I was studying with a very wonderful teacher in, ha in Canada. And she sent me to this lady who helps you understand your psychic gifts. And frankly, I was very reluctant because I'd just written a book about how to overcome depression without drugs, you know, how to, you know, holistic treatments for, de you know, depression. And, you know, then I, there I was driving to somebody to, you know, find out whether or not I'm psychic. So I remember sort of having this little personal crisis because it was like, you know, great. Uh, this is not really something I want to know about. And, um, and yet, you know, my whole life I had all these people who were clairvoyant around me who would tell me things that, about me that I really didn't want to know. Anyway, long story short, I have the same gift as Edgar Cayce, who was a famous medical intuitive, and that is that I can read anybody anywhere. And so somebody can tell me, like I, I have clients in England, you know, people that I've never met, or Australia, and I'm talking to them all about themselves and all about their mother and, and so on. So I just have, basically, in a nutshell, Rama, is that I have the ability to focus on a person and figure out not only, you know, what is wrong with that person, okay, but also what will work to make them better. And frankly, I'll give you an example. Um, I am a very positive person, and I like to be proactive and use use my gifts for the highest for the highest good. And um, I've had the experience, and maybe any of your listeners, if they are psychic, maybe you've had the same experience. I remember one time I was driving in my car, so I'm driving on my way to the Tai Chi class, you know, and I've got that Bluetooth thing. So you know, the phone rings. You answer the phone. There's this man on the phone, his wife left him, and he's calling me. I'm driving down the interstate, and he's like, is my wife coming back? And, you know, you're on the interstate, you're driving to Tai Chi, hands free. I'm like, no, she's not coming back. And then, of course, she gets angry with me, you know, and, of course, no, she never, you know, talked to me a year and a half later, no, she never came back. And... <laughs> I don't like to answer questions like that. I'm totally capable of answering questions like that. But what I like to do, I like to help. My, my mission in life, basically, Rama, is to, to empower other people um, how to be healthier and happier. And so in a nutshell, I'm able to figure out what is wrong, but also what it will work to make people better. And it is definitely very helpful to have this sort of gift. <laughs> For example, this morning I was signed up to get a massage this morning, but every time I tuned in to Saturday morning, I, was, I just got like, this is going to be a problem. And then lo and behold, I spent all night at the emergency room with my partner who had surgery on Monday, which is another thing. <laughs> and. Um, if I had been getting a massage, I wouldn't have been able to rest up for our conversation. So, you know, um, it, it is my belief and my experience that everyone has psychic gifts, and it's just a matter, and, and frankly, this, this is a lot of what my book is about, is about how to open your gifts, okay, and how to use your gifts your gifts to be healthier and happier. But it definitely helps with business because I just tune in, yes, hire that person. No, don't hire that person. This person, like, you know, Thomas Hill, he can make your book 30% better. Suck it up. Spend the money. Do the work. So that's what I do. 
Um, Catherine, thanks for that answer. Uh, I do have a question related to the length of a book, and uh, and I kind of want to uh, merge that question uh, a little bit. Uh, um, so this is going to be a loaded question. Uh, first off, you know, you've, you've talked a, a lot about your process, and you've given us great insight into how we can be uh, better writers and better people. Um, so what is what is your book about? You kind of touched on it a little bit, but I'd like a little more discussion on that. And and how long is it? And in addition, uh, you know, kind of how long was it before uh, you uh, you know got the uh, inclination uh, to work with Thomas Hill and make it uh, more in depth? So it's kind of like uh, what was the length? Uh, when you were ready to publish, what was the length when you actually published, and then uh, what uh, what is uh, you know the book about? And perhaps uh, in hindsight, uh, you know, uh, do you feel that uh, you know? I mean, obviously everything's in divine divineness, but if you had it again, would you would you uh, uh, shoot for a target of how many words? So the question really that's in the audience is. What might be a good target for the length of a book? Okay, and and I'd have to say that <laughs> that the, probably the best expert answer on this would actually come from Tom Bird, but I know that um, you know anybody who's been to any Tom Bird's retreats would have the same experience that I did. That it was you know a very profound spiritual experience. Because the way that it happens is, well, in a nutshell, I know before I came to Tom Bird's retreat, I knew I wanted to write a book, and I did all the preparation work, like he said. You know, I spent the whole month doing all the exercises, writing, you know, if you were an animal, what would you be? If you were a road, where are you going? You know, and meditating on my book. But even before I wrote my book, I literally, Rama, I had literally just, just one sentence. And I was very nervous thinking, how the heck am I going to write an entire book when I only <laughs> know one sentence? And the one sentence that I knew was that if you want to be intuitive, you have to learn how to love and, uh, and how to love unconditionally because it's my belief that if, if you want to be intuitive, Okay, that when you love unconditionally, when you learn how to love unconditionally, you know whatever it is to know about anything or anyone, anywhere. Okay, and um, so basically, my book, in a nutshell, it's it's the book is explains about um, how to open your own intuitive gifts. Okay, and it's also about, <laughs> I'm just laughing because I'm definitely tired and, you know, and, and how to use your gifts to be healthier or hap and happier. Okay, and um, so in a nutshell. Now, as far as the length goes, um, I know that working with Thomas Hill, I added about, about uh, 20,000 words. To my book, and I'm sort of taking it backwards. What would happen was, as I said, Thomas was my copy editor, and then he emailed me and said, "You know, I like your book, but I think you need to work on it more." And then I said, "Okay." And then we we negotiated a price. We had agreed on, you know, how much he was going to charge me, and then the agreement was that basically we would uh, we would. Uh, talk on the phone about once a week, and then he would give me what he called writing exercises. And what he would do is he would meet, read my manuscript, and then he'd get to a point, you know, he'd go, okay, you're missing something here. And tell me, he'd just basically say, tell me more about that. And, you know, what about this and what about that? So basically, what he did was he, he basically he gave me a series of questions, okay, and then what I would do is I would just write 
you know, about the questions, and then afterwards, when it was all over, then everything was even more of a mess, which then goes along with, you know, trying to be impatient, I mean, patient with yourself, and, um, you know, going back to, you know, when I teach yoga, <laughs> using that as an example, I always tell people, you know, yoga is here to rock your world and that everybody always wants to be comfortable all the time, right? We want to feel comfortable all the time, we want to feel good all the time, but the truth is there are many situations in life, like last night, there I am, my partner and I at the emergency room, you know, we're sitting there, we're surrounded with, by very sick people, you know, waiting for somebody to come and answer his questions. And there's lots of situations in life where we are uncomfortable. That's the way it is. <laughs> and it's going to, you know, it's, it's like being stuck in traffic. You can either get angry, freak out, and it'll take the same amount of time. Or you can learn to be calm and at peace, and it's still going to take the same amount of time. So after working with Thomas, and he gave me these questions, then we had the original manuscript that I'd been working on, and then all these questions, and then Thomas helped me put it all together. But if I was going to estimate, guesstimate, um, I think my book is roughly, if I'm speaking from mem memory, it's about 364 pages. And so I know he helped me add about, roughly about 20,000 words, so it must have been about 40, 44,000 words, um, you know, when I, when I sent it in to copy editing. And, as, um, you know, to, the, to your question about, <laughs> you know, how long should a book be, I remember even talking to Tom in the writing workshop, you know, how the hell are we going to know when this darn thing comes to an end? And, you know, you're writing along and you're writing along, and then it, to me it was kind of like if, you, if you're on a train, in New Hampshire, and you've never been on this train in New Hampshire, and all of a sudden it comes to a stop, and there you are, and you get off. And <laughs> it was quite amazing because, as you mentioned, Rama, as I came to the end of my book, I, I realized that I was starting to cry, and I didn't want to bother anybody else in the room, so I took my large pad, you know, blank paper that we were advised to bring to the workshop, I went over to a corner with my yoga mat so as not to bother anybody, and I started writing by longhand and sobbing. And I think you, Rama, were very kind because I was crying so much, you know, that you brought me a box of Kleenex. Thank you very much. And then the darn thing just ended. And, um, you know, it, it, again, it's quite a remarkable experience. And I remember going up to Tom, I think my book has ended. And he told me, you know, we'll go for a walk. And so I went for a walk. And, <laughs> and then I come back for a, a walk. And I said to him, well, Tom, now what do I do? And he's like, write another book. And you're in your head, you're like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> I've just given blood here. And, you know, you want me to do it again. You've got to be kidding me. And um, anyway, it's just quite remarkable. Um, but anyway, so to answer your question, my book is about 364 pages. I wrote a lot of little chapters. So again, to me, that was just more user friendly. And like the lady that I listened to who, you know, who read my book this week, I got an email from somebody in California who read my book. And she, she said she liked it because you can either read it sequentially or you can just read a little chapter and they're nuggets. And I've, I've talked to so many people, Rama, who told me they've read my book, I, actually most people who read it have told me they've read it at least twice. And I hear that a lot. Or they read the book and then also listen to the audio book. So there's something about that where they go back and they get another layer. But I like to, in my writing process, what I did was I, I told a lot of stories. And when I'm doing healing work, I tell a lot of stories because when you tell a story, you know, people can follow you versus if you just blow, blankly, boldly state, state certain abstract concepts, people may not follow you. 
But if you're talking about, I'm talking about my dog or my orchids or my garden, then you can follow me. It's like this is a person. They're having an everyday experience, and I can relate to them. So hopefully that was helpful. You know, uh, it reminds me of a uh, of a story that Tom uh, that Tom tells uh, about the length of a book. Uh, this is a you know I've I've been working with Tom for just about three years now, but Tom has been doing this for. 35 years he's gone through uh, many different uh, you know systems and worked with many different people and he uh, he talks about this uh, one time when there was an editor he that was presenting uh, in front of one of Tom's groups and the question was related to well uh, how long should a book be and the editor looked at the person and said well how long are your legs and uh, the guy said, long enough, and that was the answer. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, um, it, it is, it, you know, we we do struggle with this, uh, um, you know, definitely. I mean, uh, I I look at the length of your, your manuscripts coming to me, okay? I am not, you know, Tom Bird. I'm not the intuitive, uh, you know, uh, uh, man. I'm the timeline manager. I'm the detail guy. And... You know, I look at them, and if they're too short, uh, you know, I wonder. And I actually identify that to Tom, uh, you know, before he uh, gets it, saying, hey, look, I'm a little concerned here that this is uh, on the shorter side. Now, um, I know in my book, when I uh, did my first draft, it was 22,000 words. And then coming out of my style edit, uh, where I was recommended to, you know, do some additions. It closed out at about 29,000 words. And then with all my front matter, I crested 30,000 words. And frankly, I was shocked that it was that long. Um, but, you know, Catherine identified in our writing retreats, you don't know when that book is going to end. It ends on its own. And Tom has various uh, tools that he goes with the, you know, uses with the author to make sure that it isn't, com you know, that it is complete. It's not just a false, false ending. So we, you know, run people through, uh, you know, quite a few little tests to determine. And then, of course, you know, the reason Tom, you know, has us write, go right into the next book is because we are working from an author within state. Uh, we're essentially not in a analytical mind when we're writing these books. We're in a, you know, a heart space, so to speak. And uh, if we get into the revision of that book, we need to stay in that same heart space. Otherwise, we're going to ruin our book. And so that's why Tom keeps us writing and he has a formula where you write some and you revise some, and you write some and you revise some to keep us in that state. Um, it's very uh, often where we uh, try to work our revisions and we get very judgmental of our our book. And uh, and I think this uh, this uh, Rika uh, gal uh, is could be a guy, so I apologize, he's struggling with some of that stuff. Uh, you know, Rika, if you want to email me, Rama, R-A-M-A, -A, at TomBird.com, uh, we can dialogue a little bit and uh, we can share some insights. Um, the other question, uh, uh, there are a couple other questions. One is, uh, you know, who did your audio book? And I think it was uh, Raven Audio Books. And they are located in the Phoenix area in one of the outer suburbs. Um, they seemed affordable. I did a lot of research on audiobooks. And although, uh, you know, Catherine did run into a few issues, uh, they were somewhat minor in the, in the big uh, picture. And his prices were literally a third of what, what else I found. Uh, so, you know, they're very professional. Uh, Catherine did not do the voice herself. She had voice talent do it. They was professionally edited, and uh, it turned out really good. You know, I am running out of time, uh, uh, so I'd like to say one thing before uh, 
I get into the last uh, few questions is that uh, um, uh, Mary Garner is on the line today. Mary Garner has just uh, uh, released her second book called Calling All Angels. And she is uh, trying to get this book uh, into uh, one of the number one slots uh, you know, on, uh, on Amazon, and she needs a little bit of help. So if anyone uh, is interested, uh, you can uh, Google Mary Garner Calling All Angels. And uh, if you were to uh, purchase one of her Kindle books, which probably is not very expensive, it will help her move into that number one slot. So uh, hopefully we'll get, get you there, Mary. Um, Deb McTiernan has an interesting question, and this is not about your book, but about, uh, you know, uh, you know what uh, what you do as a medical intuitive. Um, you know, she is asking a question. Let me see if I can get it up here. Um, how do you love someone who is toxic unconditionally, like a family member, and still keep your distance and not get sucked in um, to you know the situation? You have any insight for her? Well, great, great question. Great, great question. Well, first of all, one of the points that I want to make, and I'm going to take this point by point, is that basically if we think about, you know, a line, like a straight line, okay, with like A on one side and B on the other, okay, or the spectrum of color, all right, with like blue on one side and red on the other, okay, and the truth is, is that intuition, if you follow, follow my analogy, is intuition is on one end and judgment is on the other. Okay, so in fact, it's one of my things that I talk about in my book is that you can't access your intuition if you go into, if you go into judgment. All right, now, it's very common, you know, we all have our family stuff, and for the record, I spent two years in a support group for battered women. So, you know, however, if you were to meet me or talk to me or interact with me in any form or fashion, you would not interact with my victim ar archetype. I, I could go on and on about that. But anyway, but my, here's my point. Frequently, okay, on, when we look when we when we look at other at other people okay what is going on at the soul level is often a 180 degree difference okay than than what is going on at the ego mind level so I'll use a simple example uh, for example I had one client years ago and when she was growing up, she was, her father battered her a lot. And she would literally stand between her father and the other, her other, you know, her brothers and sisters, and she would take the beating instead of her brothers and sisters. And when we, you know, obviously, you know, this was, you know, a very traumatic thing and, had, you know, had caused a tremendous amount of mental, emotional, and physical side effects to her health. However, when we looked at it on the soul level, his soul was actually trying to teach her soul um, how to be a stronger person. And she had become a stronger person. And when we're really honest with ourselves, you know, those awful people that we grew up with, you know, that, you know, our ego doesn't like, you know, we wouldn't be who we are today without them. I wouldn't be who I am today without my father. Okay, and I could go on and on about, you know, this and that and what happened and, you know, my story, right? Because the ego always has a story about these awful people. And yet we have to remember that everybody is a soul. And the way that I look at it also, this, this is Catherine, this is my belief and my experience and I honor everybody else's belief and experience. So if you don't like, if it doesn't work for you, you can just throw it away. The, the way that I look at it is that it's, you know, basically it's, it's all God. It's all one energy. 
and and if you if you truly believe that it's it's all all one energy and all God then therefore ergo it must all be good okay including those so-called awful people who supposedly did all these terrible things to us okay so it's my experience also that your entire life has been set up like a personalized self-study course in spiritual development just for you okay and what I may need to learn may need maybe totally something totally different than something else that somebody needs to learn but I think it's a really good it's a very good at least intellectual exercise okay is that when we you know think about those horrible toxic people that we grew up with and all the awful things they supposedly did to us because we're all victims of course it's a great intellectual exercise to ask yourself you know if you were looking at this situation okay from the soul level from your soul and from their soul you know would it would it actually look any different okay than it does at the ego level and I don't know if that's helpful or not and 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 you know the last thing I want to say is that in my practice I'll just say that I work with all kinds of energies okay and just like for convenience sake we call some energy salt and we call other energy pepper and we call some energy red and we call some other energy blue and we call some energy angelic and other energy demonic just you know to kind of keep it all straight and keep you know for you know so we can follow along and understand but it's still all one energy and I think part of following this intuitive path is to really practice seeing things from this larger perspective because the truth is is that to develop our intuitive skills what that literally means is seeing a larger picture you know having a, a, a higher level of awareness okay and to realize is that there there is no such thing as a victim okay a so if there is no such as a vic thing as a victim then possibly all the horrible things that supposedly happened to you were actually a good thing and I could go on and on about how every you know all these horrible things that supposedly happened to me ended up being a great blessing okay and lastly there is no such thing as a vacuum and what that means when you understand that there's no such thing as a vacuum is that if there is something that you truly need okay you already have it it may be just I have this phone number and if I call that phone number, I'm going to reach this person, and that, that person has a friend, and that person has a friend, and that person has a friend, and then I'm going to get to the resource that I need. And um, it is true that our ego definitely has preferences, and I like people to be kind. I like people to be grateful. You know, I appreciate beauty and orchids and organic gardening and, you know, people who take care of the earth and who take care of the animals. But you know, when when we when our emotions come up again, I just encourage everybody to look at the bigger picture and ask yourself: If I was looking at this from the soul level, would this actually look different? I don't know if that's helpful or not. You know, I think it is very helpful. Uh, I'm going to uh, thank you uh, for this great uh, interview. You know. Uh, you spoke the whole time, a few questions here and there. Uh, just uh, one more, uh, uh, the name of Catherine's book is What is Healing? Awaken Your Intuitive Power for Health and Happiness. Catherine Carrigan, C-A-R-R-I-G-A-N. It is an Amazon bestseller in a number of categories. There's an audio book. Uh, you can subscribe to uh, Catherine's newsletter and blog by going to her website, www.catherinecarrigan.com. For those of you that uh, have been looking at your computer screen, uh, 
her book cover is up, and I've kind of had uh, some uh, images of her website. Uh, Catherine, thank you very much. Uh, your interview has been tremendous, and uh, you know I look forward to uh, doing another interview with you uh, uh, with your next book. Okay, thank you so much, Rama. And again, all you authors, send me an email and I'll trade blogs, okay? Thank you.